Chapter 4, The Stomach and Intestines We ask the reader to carefully study the accompanying diagram of the stomach and intestines, for we shall have much to say regarding them in this little book. The student who will take the trouble to refer to the diagram will be able to understand the theories and practice referred to herein, much better than will one who merely glances at it and passes it by as uninteresting. The majority of diseases may be traced back to troubles in the stomach and intestines and the student who wishes to have a fundamental idea of the theory of cure of diseases, as well as the methods leading to such cures, should pay much attention to this part of the human system before he passes on to a consideration of other parts. It has been claimed that nine-tenths of the diseases and physical disorders afflicting the human race have their rise and origin in this part of the system, and therefore it follows that if one acquaints himself with the normal functions of these organs, he will be able to construct for himself a working theory of treatment of conditions arising from an abnormal functioning of the same organs. Therefore we beg of you to read carefully the following brief description of the stomach and intestines. Diagram of Stomach and Intestines A. Stomach B. Small Intestines C. Cecum D. Vermiform Appendix E. Ascending Colon F. Transverse Colon G. Descending colon. H. Sigmoid flexure. I. Rectum. J. Anus referring to the diagram, and accompanying key to same, and using the letters attached thereto, we begin at, A. The stomach. This organ is a pear-shaped muscular bag, holding over a quart. The food enters the stomach, after being chewed by the teeth manipulated by the lips, tongue and cheeks and moistened and softened by the saliva which fluid also has a chemical action on the food, changing the cooked starch of the food into dextrin, then into glucose. The mass of masticated and insalivated food reaches the stomach by means of a tube called the gullet or esophagus which enters it at its upper opening. The stomach then begins to digest the food, by means of a fluid which it secretes which is called the gastric juice. The gastric juice flows out in great quantities, and produces a chemical action on the food mass which changes its nature by dissolving certain portions of it releasing the fat and breaking it up and transforming some of the albuminous material, such as lean meat, the gluten of wheat and the whites of eggs, into albuminos, in which form it may be absorbed. While this chemical work of digestion is going on, the fluid portion of the food mass as well as the fluids which have been drunk has been separated from the solids and then absorbed through the walls of the stomach and taken up by the circulation or blood supply and carried out of the system by means of the kidneys, skin, etc. While the digestive work is going on, the stomach muscles are busily at work churning up the digested food. Soon a gray, semi-fluid mass is formed, called chyme, composed of a mixture of some of the sugar and salts of the food transformed starch or glucose softened starch, broken fat etc. and albuminose. The above description refers to a stomach acting properly. In cases of indigestion, dyspepsia, etc. The stomach becomes like a great yeast pot, filled with a sour, fermenting and putrefying mass. This mass of chemically changed matter, called the chyme, then passes on through the pyloric opening or gate, into the small intestine, which we shall now describe. b. The small intestines. This important part of the digestive system consists of a long intestine, or tube, nearly 30 feet in length which is ingeniously wound around or coiled upon itself so that it occupies but a small space in comparison with its great length. Its entire length is lined with a soft velvety covering, arranged in a peculiar way that resembles plush, the appearance being caused by numerous small elevations known as the intestinal villi, which act as absorbents, secretants, etc. The chyme which has just entered the small intestine from the stomach passes along the 30 feet of velvety tubing, being subjected to the action of the bile, and pancreatic juices, which enter the intestine from the liver and pancreas, as well as the action of the intestinal fluids which are secreted in the small intestine itself. These fluids still further soften and dissolve the chyme, and the chemical processes caused by their presence transforms the chyme into three substances, viz., 1, peptone, resulting from the digestion of albuminous matter, 2, chyle resulting from the emulsion of the fatty particles and, 3, glucose, 
resulting from the transformation of the starch substances. These three substances are absorbed through the walls of the small intestines, and are carried into the circulation or blood supply, and thence to all parts of the system. We have not referred to the part played by the liver in this work, as our object is principally to follow the course of the food mass through the stomach and intestines. After the valuable portions of the food mass have been absorbed in the small intestine, the balance the excrement, waste, refuse matter, etc., passes through a small opening, known as the ileocochal valve into the large intestine or colon. This little valve is constructed quite ingeniously, in such a manner as to allow the excrement to pass freely into the colon but which prevents any of it from returning to the small intestine. Let us now follow this waste matter in the great sewer of the system the colon. C. Cecum. The cecum is a large blind end of the colon, just beyond the point where the excrement enters it from the small intestine. It is a rounded cavity. D. Vermiform appendix. The vermiform appendix to the cecum is the little worm-like appendage which when inflamed gives rise to the trouble known as appendicitis. It is from 1 to 5 inches in length, and its uses are not known. Some claim that it furnishes a fluid needed in the work of lubrication, while others claim that it is the vestige of an organ which has outlived its usefulness in the course of evolution. E. F. G. H. I. The colon. The colon is the large intestine, or great canal, consisting of a large, membranous tube of about 5 feet in length rising as the ascending colon, e, on the right side of the abdomen then passing over the small intestine, as the transverse colon, f, then descending down the left side as the descending colon, g, then forming that peculiar twist, curve, or knotty shape known as the sigmoid flexure, h at the lower left-hand side of the abdomen then passing into the smaller tube, known as the rectum, which is its terminal section, which ends in the anus, J, or outer rear opening through which the excrement passes from the body. The colon is the great sewer of the body, through which the waste matter, refuse and excrement, known as the feces, or fecal matter, is carried away toward the anus there to be expelled by a movement or passage. When this great sewer is allowed to become clogged, the condition called constipation ensues, and other evils follow in its train. The walls of the colon contain tiny absorbent channels, which tend to reabsorb into the system the foul putrefying poisonous excrement, or waste matter, which constipation prevents from passing along the normal channel, and which accumulates and chokes up the colon thus rendering the normally clean colon the receptacle and retainer of a foul, putrefying mass. The absorbent capacity of the walls of the colon has been proven by its capacity to absorb drugs that have been injected into it, the effects being manifested in a few minutes. Moreover, nourishment is often administered in this way, through the colon, in cases where the patient is unable to retain food in the stomach. So you see that the colon is capable of absorbing some very undesirable material back into the system, in cases in which it becomes clogged or obstructed. It is like the action of a sewer which backs up into your house drain pipes, when it becomes clogged or stopped. This fact is not realized by the majority of people, who fail to realize the dangers of the situation. It is with the colon that we are chiefly concerned in this consideration of the source of disease. In our next chapter, we shall consider it in detail.